UFC prediction time once again. We're doing the Dillashaw versus Cruz card. Uh, a couple of un un couple of um, fights that are not necessarily fully confirmed, but we'll be going with the rumors. Um, just a quick touch on the last pay per view card. I uh, didn't do so great with the picks. Um, some of it was due to bad judging. Um, I really do think Joe Soto won his fight. Um, that's not just because I picked him, because to counter that, I picked Justin Keish, and I thought Nina Ansaroff won. Uh, although I do understand the that that particular one, I, I can dig. I can dig the split. I see the, for lack of a better term, confusion. Um, it's a close fight versus a fight that necessarily went incorrectly. But if I had been a judge, Ansaroff would have won. If I had been a judge, Soto would have won. Had I been a judge, Carlos Condit would have won. So a lot of decisions I don't wholeheartedly agree with. Um, obviously, I'm going to touch on the Condit one real quick. I scored rounds one, two, three, and four, all for Condit. Now, backing up, people want to score round two for Lawler, and I have no problem with that because of the drop. That being said, I think we're kind of back into this idea that drops are a huge thing in MMA, and they're they're not. We're 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 talking about drops as if this were boxing. You know, if you drop a guy in boxing, you instantly probably win a 10-8 round, not even just 10-9 round, but you, you, largely you, you, will, you will definitely win the round. The difference is, though, is that when you drop someone in boxing, it's a big deal because people don't get dropped as much. There's not as many slips. There's not as many... Uh, there's obviously the bigger gloves, so you've got to land cleaner to get a knockdown in boxing with the larger gloves. In MMA, you land clean. I mean, like, this is the thing that I, I kind of ask. It's, it doesn't necessarily duplicate in this fight, but if I drop you with one punch, start of the round, you get back up, you kick my ass for the remaining four plus minutes. Did you win the round? I think you did. And that wasn't quite that extreme, but, like, if you look at it, Lawler only outlanded Condit in the fifth round. Um, I'm pretty sure. If someone wants to pull up fight metric and show that that's not the case, fine. I'm game for it. I, I, again, I don't have a problem with Lawler winning the second. I thought it was a, it was a closer round, and, and he did get the knockdown. But I look at the first round, he got knocked down. I look at the second, uh, the third, and the fourth. He got outlanded very heavily. And I know people are going to say, quality over quantity. Lawler was hurting him. I don't think Lawler was. When you look at Condit at the end, I mean, even after a brutal fifth round... He's not really hurt. I don't mean like on a cosmetic point of view, but like his brain is still there. He's not wobbling. Like we're kind of assuming Lawler did more damage because Lawler historically hits harder, but we have nothing from the fight itself to suggest that. That's my point. Um, I'd be quite happy for rematch because the fifth round was awesome. But kind of won that fight. <clears throat> that being said, people will call this karma for the whole Nick Diaz fight that Condit won. I wouldn't necessarily disagree. I mean, I didn't think he won that fight, but so it does, you know, what goes around comes around, I guess. But this kind of goes back to the whole MMA judging. What are we doing sometimes? Anyways, on to the fight card at home. Francis Barosa versus Elvis, Elvis Mutapasic. Uh, Elvis Mutapasic making his UFC debut. Uh, Pretty long awaited, to be honest. I mean, Elvis has been around a really long time to not have gotten a title shot before now. 15 and 3, fighting since professionally since 2007. Uh, he does have some concerning losses, like most recently losing to Jesse Taylor in 2013. Uh, 2013, Jesse Taylor's not so great, but and but he does have some wins over some guys who have had UFC time. Sam Alvey, most notably, Cesar Fajaya, uh, Zach Cummings. He has wins over all of them, um, plus a reasonably decent win over Joe Henley, who's been a solid prospect for a long, long time. Was on the Elvin Fighter at one point, uh, lost his one fight. Most people thought he was going to get the, I can't remember if it was the wild card fight, or no, no, it was the um, the fight to replace Nick Ring. That's what it was, because Nick Ring got hurt. Pretty sure that's what it was. Um, and it was Court McGee versus James Hammertree. And James Hammertree got it because he went and... I want to say begged, because, I mean, props to Hammertree for chasing after Dana White and making his case. Like, I have no problem with that, but 
it does always seem like Henley was the better fighter, the more promising fighter, the one who looked better on the show and probably should have got it. Uh, a chance. I'll put it that way. Anyways, he is fighting Francimar Barossa, 35-year-old, recently had that ugly, ugly, uh, I can't emphasize this now, ugly win over Ryan Jimmo. Prior to that, he had split fights being Ednaldo Oliveira, losing to Hans Stringer. Um, I'm really hoping for Elvis to win. Elvis is a more exciting fighter. He's a more interesting fighter. He's the younger fighter at 29 years old. Barossa, 35-year-old, new retirement. Barossa kind of never really was anything. Has had his chance to sort of prove that he is something. Looking at this, um, Elvis, I think, is the smaller fighter. I mean, man who normally fights at middleweight, not 205, six feet tall. He's not a lot shorter, but Barossa's a fairly large one, 205-er. That concerns me. I, I do believe Elvis is the better technical fighter. Barossa's stand-up is not great. Elvis' stand-up is not particularly amazing either, but I think Elvis has just a more well-rounded game. He'll just have to get by the size disadvantage that he's at. Um, I'm going to take Elvis, but this could be just a blind one because Bar I, I dislike Barossa so much. I want to see Elvis succeed. Um, and also you have the late nose replacement issue of this, where this was supposed to be uh, Barossa versus, I, I can't recall, it was a Russian prospect, one who I was picking to beat Barossa for the record. Um, and the short notice nature could be a problem. Um, so we'll see, but I'm going to go with Elvis Mutopisic uh, and hope that he picks up the victory. Moving on, I've actually got the Sure Dog Fight Finder, and I've got the Fight Finders in front of me for a change to see I can quote actual records. Rob Font versus Joey, Go uh, Joey Gomez. Excited for this one. Um, the only thing I'm really going to guarantee is that it's a knockout. Uh, these two guys have knockout power and have some defensive deficiencies. Um, <laughs> Joey Gomez has just not the level of competition. I'm, I'm going to go with Rob Font. Uh, Joey Gomez, by the way, please change your nickname from War Machine. That thing is soiled forever. Uh, but I'm going to go with Rob Font via TKO or KO. Should be a fun fight, though. Moving on up in the world, we get to Sean O'Connell versus Ila Latifi. Ila Latifi, a 5'8". I've always said it. He's, got, he's so short that it just makes it very hard to pick him all the time, despite the fact that he's beaten Cyril Dawadi, Hanstringer, and Chris Dempsey lost it. Jan Blackowitz and Gegard Busasi, no shame there. Sean O'Connell, not a super impressive fighter. Has finally got something going here against Anthony Parash and Matt Van Buren, but like Van Buren, not UFC talent. Parash, probably also not UFC talent, and old. Um, we're going to go with Latifi to win a decision here. But uh, not really looking forward to that fight. Moving on, we have Charles Rosa versus, according to Sure Dog, it is an unknown fighter. According to other sources, it's and Augusto Toquinho, again, another nickname that probably should never be used again. Mendez, I'm going with Charles Rosa, who is a fantastic grappler to pick up the victory in this one. Um... Although, you know what, I really felt good about Charles Rosa against Yair Rodriguez, and that didn't pan out, so we'll see. Uh, again, also, that's a late notice replacement. And I always have a rule with late notice replacements. It's it's the fighter who adapts better to the change in opponents slash the short prep time that is going to sometimes win that fight, even a fight that they normally would not win. Um, so there's always that wild card, but I, I'm going to go with Rosa by decision. Tim Boach, Ed Herman, going with Tim Boach on this one. Ed Herman is not someone I have a tremendous amount of faith in at this point in his career. Um, despite being a good offensive wrestler, he's really weak defensively. Now, mind you, Tim Boach did get knocked out by Dan Henderson. So, man, <laughs> this is just a two-hot pick. Um, two guys I really don't trust. I'm going to go with Boach. I'm a Barbarian fan. I shouldn't be, but he something about him is always giving me hope, I guess. Um, Paul Felder versus Darren Crookshank, taking Paul Felder to knock out Darren Crookshank. Crookshank, I think, is just somewhat done at this point. Maximum Blanco versus Luke Saunders. 
I think this is, or Sanders, I think this one's also a late notice replacement because I'm pretty sure Blanco is fighting someone else. I can't recall who. Uh, going with Maximo Blanco to win by TKO. Blanco is an amazing fighter or he's a terrible fighter. And if The thing is, I think even like tentative, unengaged Maximo Blanco when he's at his worst probably has enough to be uh, Luke Sanders. Uh, Chris Wade versus Megni Bag Bagdad. Is it Bagdad? Is it actually Bagdad? That's, that's kind of surprising. Uh, hang on. Do I know who this guy is? Not really. Um, okay. Well, I don't really know who he is. So there's your answer. <laughs> we'll go with Chris Wade. Decision because he doesn't seem to... Generally finish a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, moving on to Killer B Ben Saunders. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Ben Saunders, Patrick Cote. Great fight. Um, okay, Patrick Cote, not super impressive recently, to be honest. Like, yes, he beat Josh Berkman, and that was a good win. Yes, he beat Joe Riggs. Joe Riggs is dead meat. Um, but... You look at his fight with Wonderboy Thompson, and it does seem like the division, in terms of speed, is passing him by. He's getting a little slower. His stand-up is becoming less of a dominant factor. He's becoming more reliant on some skills that don't fade with age. Basically, the ability to wrestle people down, grapple, use your size. He's going to try and do this with Ben Saunders, but Ben Saunders has... Not an amazing ground game, but he's long, like he can hit submissions from different angles, very difficult to control on the ground, very dangerous, kind of like, um, kind of like a Kraken, which was kind of on my mind, because thinking about that for an esports team name. Um, I just, uh, I mean, I, I can see Kote getting this on top position. I can, but on the feet, I give the advantage to Saunders on the ground. I give the fight ending potential to Saunders, although Saunders' takedown defense is bad. So it ends up there. He usually ends up on bottom. This causes Saunders to lose fights that he doesn't or Saunders to lose fights he doesn't necessarily shouldn't necessarily lose. Ben Saunders by split decision. I'm very interested in this fight, though. I'm kind of groaning about it. But I'm groaning about having to pick it. I'm not groaning about watching it. Uh, Francisco Trinaldo, aka Gleason T. Bow, what light versus Ross Pearson? Uh, gonna go with Pearson. Um, superior foot, uh, superior movement, just in general, footwork and so on, and hand speed, so on. Trinaldo is huge, but I think Pearson has the ability to stay away from him to make the fight into a bit of a kickboxing match, which he's better at. Um, also, Ross Bruce is pretty good lately. I mean, the Evan Dunham fight was not good, and that 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 does give me pause because a lot of what Dunham did, Trinaldo probably can do to a certain level. But he looked okay against Iakin until getting finished. Should have beaten Diego Sanchez. Been debated, of course, a lot. Knocked out Maynard, had it, uh, Sam Stout had a pretty impressive fight against Paul Felder. Uh, we're going to have to. I'm going to have to go with Ross Pearson by decision, but. Again, a pretty interesting fight. Uh, Matt Mitchell and Travis Brown taking Travis Brown. I was really, really was looking forward to this fight, and I've been calling for it for a very long time, and I think it's happening at the wrong point because I just think Mitrione is kind of on the downslide. Granted, I think Brown's having some problems adjusting to life at Glendale, a.k.a. For, a, for, a, for, a, for, a, you know, Ronda Rousey's gym, a.k.a. going downhill. Um, but, I mean, losing to Andre Arlovsky is not the same as losing to Ben Rothwell. Um, I think Brown has the option to take this to the ground if he needs to. I think, I do honestly believe he's the better striker of the two. I do believe he can win this fight. I think that this is, this is the type of fight that if Travis Brown doesn't win, he's just never going to live up to his potential. And the pressure's on. I think this is the time to do it. Uh, I'll take Mitrion. It's heavyweight, so I'm, I'm tempted to not pick a decision, even though I, I don't think Mitrion's easy to finish. Um, let's go with the TKO for Travis Brown, um, just because I don't like picking decisions at <laughs> heavyweight. 
Uh, Eddie Alvarez versus Anthony Pettis. I'm going to surprise some people probably in picking at Eddie Alvarez. Anthony Pettis coming off of a big loss to RDA. Has historically had a problem with people who can come forward and are not just at a huge disadvantage to him at that range. Now, what I mean to, about that is, like, if we look at Pettis' best wins, Gilbert Melendez, Ben Henderson, Donald Cerrone, Lozon, Jeremy Stevens, probably his best wins. Stevens was a surprisingly close fight. Lozon does not have the ability to keep up to him on just athletic tools. Cerrone is a slow starter, and he knocked him out early. Benson Henderson is really not a guy who like. I mean, he, he's not a guy who likes to make it ugly and grindy. Like he he likes to take you down, and we generally assume that with grinder. What I mean by this though is a constant in-your-face diversity of doing. I'm striking and I'm taking you down. I'm taking you down and I'm striking, and I'm seamlessly moving from A to B. Um, or not seamlessly, but I'm, I'm trying to at least move baby. Benson Henderson is more like, I'm striking with you, now I'm trying to take you down. And there's that kind of differential to it. Gilbert Melendez is the same kind of thing. Um, and then Cerrone, like I said, just a little starter with lows on thinking about. I think Eddie Alvarez is the kind of guy who can seamlessly mix his boxing with his wrestling to keep the pressure on Pettis, and that's when Pettis doesn't do well. If Pettis can fix this, the world opens up to him because he is a fantastic athlete, creative striker. Grappling is very solid. He's got really all these gifts. He just doesn't handle this one particular aspect well, and it's shown up in pretty much all of his, all three of his losses to Dos Anjos, Clay Guida, and Bart Palaszewski. Um, not as much with the Guida thing. Guida was more like, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to take you down. And I'm Clay Guida. This is what I do. I put the pace on you and I take you down. Um, and he didn't handle that well. But that's the kind of thing. I, I Alvarez can probably replicate elements of this. It's a, it's a very interesting fight. I'm really, really looking forward to this. And hopefully we'll get um, a really solid out outing from Eddie Alvarez that doesn't leave a lot of confusion as to if he won the fight, because people still did not like the Melendez fight. And of course he lost to Donald Cerrone. Fantastic fight, but he did lose. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I gotta go with Alvarez decision. I, I, I feel like I do. Dominic Cruz, TJ Dillashaw. Dominic Cruz is actually only a year older than TJ Dillashaw. I would not have thought that. Um... I have never been super sold on TJ Dillashaw. And the reason is is that if you take away his two fights with Henan Burrell, which is the same fighter, he doesn't look like the same fighter against anyone else. You look at his fight with Joe Soto, he won that fight, but he did not look terribly convincing. Mike Easton, not terribly convincing. Hugo Viana, convincing, but it's Hugo Viana. Issei Tamora, convincing, but, like, you'll note that, like, his other wins in the UFC are YL Watson, Von Lee, Issei Tamora, Hugo Viana, and Mike Easton and Joe Soto. All of those guys were probably at no point top 10. Uh, maybe Easton was at some point, but Easton turned out to be pretty much a bust. Um, they're just not top notch, and he... It's, it's hard for me to reconcile the fighter who looks so fantastic against Hannah Brown. Fantastic. And the guy who's looked kind of mediocre against some of these other kind of low-level guys. And it's like, which is the real TJ Dillashaw? Is the real TJ Dillashaw somewhere in the middle? It's it's hard. It's really hard. Um, I'm going to go with Dominic Cruz, but on Dominic Cruz's side, of course, there's always the question about health. But it 135, Dominic Cruz has always looked kind of un, just unstoppable. Like, looking at it, destroyed Mizugaki, 
had to go, you know, had to go the distance with Demetrius Johnson, Uriah Faber, Scott Jorgensen, but like convincingly so. Joe Benavides did give him a good fight. I forgot about that one. Benavides versus Cruz too. Uh, Brian Bowles beat him pretty easily. Joe Benavides in the first one beat him pretty easily. Ironically, Benavides came back harder in the rematch, which is not normally the case for ben Joe Benavides. Um, the win over E. McCall, the win over Charlie Valencia. Um, he's just... Dominic Cruz every time out looks great. TJ Dillashaw looks great in two fights and hasn't looked great in anything else. I'm going with Dominic Cruz. I think he's the better wrestler. I think he has... The better fundamental striking, although I think Dillashaw is the faster of the two, more dynamic of the two, more likely to possibly finish this shot, this fight in one like real flurry. Not necessarily one punch, because uh, neither of these guys are getting one punched. But TJ does have that ability to end the fight, one massive flurry, boom. But Cruz has the ability to take this over a five-round fight. I'm going with Dominic Cruz, going with decision. Looking forward to really a lot of this card. It's it's like for a free card. This is fantastic. Your main, your main event is great for a title. Alvarez Pettis should be lights out. Brown Mitchell owns a fight we've been wanting to see for a really, really long time. Kote Saunders is going to be a good scrap. Uh, and you got Paul Felder versus Crookshank should be fireworks as well. It's not without its painful fights. I'm not really looking forward to Tim Bosch versus Ed Herman. I'm not really looking forward to Sean O'Connell versus Eli Latifi. But there's enough here that should really have something for everyone that's an MMA fan. So let's, let's watch it, let's enjoy it, let's go, and we'll see if I can recover from a two-card two slump here where my picks have just been hot garbage. Let's roll.